Hi, welcome to today's video. My name is Paul. So this week, this week I wanted to step into the the subject matter of composition. It's a tricky subject matter. It's very, there's a lot to it. And also different people have very different ideas about composition. Even just saying the word composition is maybe enough for some people to click off the video. Um, there are sort of two extreme views on composition. So one view is that composition is vital. If you're getting into art, never mind about learning to draw or paint or color theory or perspective or any of those sort of things. What you really need to focus on is composition. That's the first thing you need to learn. It is vital to creating good art. That's one opinion. It is a bit extreme, I think, but it's one opinion. The other extreme, the polar opposite of that is that composition is a complete waste of time. It's a bunch of abstract pseudoscience ideas that really have nothing to do with reality. And you're better off just not even thinking about all of that nonsense. During the last four years, since I got back into art, I've sort of flipped from one of those extremes to the other. And nowadays I'm somewhere in the middle. When I started out, I did think composition is vital. I came across a few YouTube videos and blogs that had that opinion, tried to push that idea, and I believed them. Um, I quite quickly realized that, well, within a couple of years anyway, I realized that maybe there isn't as much to this composition as some people would have you believe. So then I sort of flipped to the other, other extreme, the other opposite, that composition is all just pseudoscience. It's abstract nonsense. It's useless. It's a waste of time. It doesn't make any difference. These days, my opinion has, I don't know, moderated or matured perhaps. And I, nowadays I think composition is useful for some people. Some people find it very useful. It's something that they can use to build on and create to create art. It's, it's a useful aid to their creation process or creative process. But at the same time, there are other people, including me, who just are not really, I don't find it that useful. I find it more of a hindrance than useful. So um, I just, I don't work with composition anymore. I just ignore it sort of thing, or most of it anyway. However, I, I do think there are elements within composition that are interesting, at least from an academic point of view, even if they're not for me anyway, that they're not really of much practical use, but they are still interesting. So maybe that that's the main point of the video maybe if you're interested the next few minutes the next five minutes or so i'm going to try and go into that a bit further and to talk about one or two artists who who used or tried to use different ideas within composition and their final thoughts on these things so maybe first of all what is composition Again, it's one of those things in art where different people have different ideas, but at its most basic, it's about arranging the elements within the picture frame, the picture plane to create perhaps something that is more aesthetically pleasing, or in some cases, maybe to help tell a story. So we'll look at a couple of those examples um, just by different artists. So this first artist is a Dutch artist, um, Vermeer, I think Johannes Vermeer. This is first name was Johannes, maybe. Um, interesting artist, one of my favorite artists, maybe surprisingly, if you look at the way I do art, um, very different from this, but I do like his paintings, or at least some of them anyway. I've only ever seen, I think, two of his paintings in real life. We don't actually have very many 
genuine Vermeer paintings in the world. I think there's less than 40 paintings in the world. Anyway, I'll say I've seen a couple of them. This one is interesting from the point of view of composition. So we can see there's, there's two women. Um, we can see that they're probably of different social status. The woman on the right who's sitting down, she's wearing very expensive looking clothes. She has expensive jewelry and she has a, a hairstyle that looks like it took a bit of time to put together. The other woman on the left, standing up, she's wearing very different clothes, very plain clothes, um, browns and blues. She doesn't seem to have any jewelry and her hairstyle is maybe more practical, let's say, just her hair is brushed back. So we can say maybe the woman on the right is a more senior position in society, let's say, she's richer, she's maybe the employer. And the woman on the left is her servant. And you can see the servant is reaching out and handing out a note or a letter. And this is an important part of the painting. It's kind of central to the painting. And Vermeer has indicated that through the use of values, I think. The note is very bright value set against the darker blues and browns of the servant's clothes. So immediately, or at least quite soon after looking at the painting, our eyes are drawn towards this note. Um, so then we start to think, well, who is the note from? What is it? Um, we start to think of a, a story behind this painting. And that is one of the uses of composition. If you're trying to tell a story, you want to have a focal point, at least one focal point, maybe two, and then you want to use values, you want to use contrast, contrasting values, colors, uh, shapes, to draw the viewer's eye to your one of your main focal points in the painting. Of course, not all paintings tell a story. Um, there's another Dutch artist, uh, Mondrian. Obviously, there's no story here. This is not representational art. But there is still a sense of composition that the artist deliberately put down the lines and the colors, I say, in a deliberate way. It wasn't by chance. It wasn't a random thing. So there is some sort of compositional thing going on. And in this case, the compositional thing is maybe aimed towards aesthetic value rather than trying to tell a story. The black lines, the vertical and horizontal lines, they're not equally spaced. Um, and of course, they create rectangles within the, the painting plane. And some of those rectangles he's left as white, but some of them he's colored. It's red, yellow or blue. So again, these are probably compositional choices. So that's how I think of composition. It's, it may be arranging things for aesthetic values. It may be trying to draw attention to focal points in order to tell a story through the painting. It's using colors. It's using shapes and lines, edges, values. All of those different things come into composition. So it's not just about the positioning of things. It's about using all these things like colors and values and lines and so on. So as I say, composition is quite a big topic. It's a complex thing. Um, if we look at some of the technical ideas around composition, probably one of the easiest ways of getting into composition, if you want to try this, is, especially with landscapes, is some of the ideas of Edgar Payne. So he was a, an American landscape artist and he wrote at least one or two books on painting landscapes. And in one of those books, he puts forward these ideas of these templates, if you like, and he gives them different names. As you can see, some of them are pretty straightforward, like a circle, a triangle, a letter of the alphabet, that type of thing. 
and then he gives some examples, little thumbnail sketches, examples of how to use these templates to create landscapes. This is one approach and this is probably the most the most approachable um, way of getting into composition if you're new to art or you're just getting back into art. And it is worth exploring these templates, um, but they are limited. And I personally, I don't like the idea of trying to fit my art into ready-made templates. It just, there's something about it I don't like. It's a restrictive thing, and I don't like any sort of restrictions when it comes to art. There are more complex ideas. So we have these harmonic armatures and dynamic symmetry. So harmonic armatures, you can see on the left, an example of a harmonic armature. It's basically a very fancy name for lines lines drawn onto the canvas, or at least imaginary lines on the canvas. And you get this sort of complex geometrical grid. And there are people who say that this is how the great masters painted their paintings. People like Rembrandt, for example, would have used these harmonic armatures. Um, Bibi Vermeer as well would have used these. And there is evidence that they, they at least some of them probably did. And you can see on the right, somebody's taken, I think this is a, another painting by Vermeer, and put one of these harmonic armatures on top of the painting to demonstrate that, well, something. I'm not quite sure what they're demonstrating, but to some people it makes sense. But anyway, fancy word for a grid. Now, again, some people will find this useful and helpful in making art. For me, uh, no, this is not going to work. I can't imagine starting a painting by creating a grid like this and then somehow trying to fit everything onto that grid. Again, it's restrictive. It's, it seems very mechanical and very um, artificial way of creating painting. I prefer a much more spontaneous and organic approach to painting. So this for me is the complete opposite of the way I would do a painting. But as I say, for some people it works. It depends on the style of art you're doing, your personality. There's lots of different factors go into this. But I think the point I'm trying to make is it's there. If you're interested, you know, by all means, go and study it. Um, maybe try to use it, but don't feel that by not using it, that you're somehow a lesser artist. You know, obviously the artists who use these things are very intelligent and very um, amazing artists. Well, no, they're not. They're just people who are, who have it in their head that these sort of grids are essential to making good art. It's just an idea. There's no such thing as the correct way to make art. We all have our different ideas. If you want to do this, go for it. If you want to ignore this, ignore it. I ignore it. Um, it doesn't make sense to me. It seems useless to me. There's another idea as well, dynamic symmetry. So this was popular, I think, in the early part of the 20th century, 1920s, 30s, that sort of time, perhaps. So I want to talk about another artist, um, this guy, Norman Rockwell, famous artist, famous illustrator. He did a lot of illustration work for a famous magazine that I can't remember the name of, Saturday Night Post or something like that. Anyway, very famous artist, very famous American artist, um, sort of iconic, really. Norman was doing this he became very famous and at some point somebody mentioned to him this idea of dynamic symmetry has has does he use dynamic symmetry Norman Rockwell replied that he had no idea he'd never heard of this dynamic symmetry what is it so the person said well there's there's books being published on it 
You should read these books. It's the latest thing. It's sort of science meets art. It's amazing. So Norman Rockwell went and got a book, started reading it, and became very interested in this idea, idea of dynamic symmetry. I should say dynamic symmetry is basically very similar to the harmonic armatures. It's this idea of using complex grids to help with composition. So Norman Rockwell started using, incorporating these ideas of dynamic symmetry into his art. And for about a year or so, he was doing this. Towards the end of that year or so, he started looking at his older work and this newer work and comparing it. And he came to the conclusion that all of this dynamic symmetry hadn't helped at all, not one iota. It just, it was interesting ideas, but his old work was just as good as this new work. So it's not that the dynamic symmetry hindered his ability to make art. It just, it didn't seem to do anything really. It didn't seem to have any great benefits. So basically he gave up on the idea, went back to just doing art the way he did for many years before that. Again, I think the main point is, you know, all of these ideas, and they are just ideas, they're not written in stone, definite, this is the way you have to do art. Just different people have different ideas. If they help you, if you find them useful, then they are useful. On the other hand, if like me, you find them all a bit abstract and a bit useless, then just ignore them. And it doesn't make you a worse or an inferior artist in any way. We all just have our own way of working and our own beliefs and ideas and interests. And composition is like that. So that, that's the idea that I have about composition these days. It's interesting from an academic point of view, but I don't find it that useful really. There are some elements within composition, the idea of using different color schemes, edges, those things to me are much more interesting, but maybe not from a purely compositional point of view. Um, and certainly these, these sort of grids and dynamic symmetry and all of this harmonic armatures and things, to me that is just, I don't, I don't get those ideas at all. I don't see how they would be of any use to me uh, in making art. Okay, well, I hope some interest. Um, if you made it this far in the video, uh, thank you for watching and listening and hopefully see you again in next week's video.